sorry, Chris. Are you about to start? Yeah, I am, but uh, I'm. Uh, ah, why? Why? Time maths. Time maths. Yeah, I know, right? I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so there's me thinking I'm like half an hour early, and actually I'm yeah. like three minutes late. That's why I'm just kind of <laughs> farting around. I hate it. And and you just missed my daylight savings rant. Uh, but uh, short ah. <clears throat> short version is, I I'm willing to make a pack with you guys, Matt, Wimpy. Yep. You guys, everybody in the chat room, everybody in the mumble room, I will make a pack starting right here. If you want. And and I and and, we, and you know the, you know they've got a couple of weeks till they catch up to us, Matt. But when we all spring ahead, when everybody's all sprung ahead, I'm gonna make a pack with you guys. You guys make a pack with me. We will not fall behind. We will refuse to do it. And listen, if we refuse to do it, then it that's that's what time it is. Like if I say it's six o'clock and we all agree at six o'clock, then it's it's Shit. fucking six o'clock. That's how it works. You're, you're gonna go all Arizona on the time savings, aren't you? Let's we'll, we're just gonna we're just gonna draw the line and we're just gonna say from now on we're done. It's a pact. It's a time pact. We're gonna make a time pact. And you know what? Don't feel silly because history will look back at us as the people that save society from a shared delusion. We will be the saviors yeah. of this shared delusion that is daylight savings time. We will be revolutionaries, and I will start it. It'll start with Jupiter Broadcasting, and it will go out from there, and we can all be part it'll of be, it. It'll become known as JB time. And you know what? I'll, 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 I'll make the case. I'll make the economic case because it devastates our live shows for like two weeks. People get it all confused, and, and it's not even people outside the U.S. People inside the effing United States of America get it confused. The, the Americans can't even keep it straight. How do we expect people outside the U.S. to keep it straight? And, and I'm starting to think that the only reason George W. Bush changed it by two weeks is just to make America different <laughs> from everybody else so the rest of the world would have to take notice of us. I'm oh, starting to think that's the only reason he did it. Oh, undoubtedly. And I'm so no, sick I, I, of it. Original, I am so the, sick of it. <laughs> Oh, the original reason is so dated, like too. I mean, it's like, what, still... farmers 50 years ago or some shit, so they get more yeah, time to around. farm shit? I don't know. Brilliant. Yeah. Part of yeah. It. yeah, no, I agree. But, okay, I agree. I agree with the whole daylight savings time two weeks difference is incredibly stupid. Yeah. The, it should show. all be the same across the world. Why is it different? <laughs> like, why is the day <laughs> changing? Like, that that's dumb. Bro. But the I'm whole just... well, hour back and forth, is who, <laughs> who really cares? But the two-week just... difference between every other country, that's ridiculous. I know. I know. Just to complete just to complete the circle of international ridiculousness, I'd like to point out that the UK is offset by one week from continental Europe as well. Oh, uh... so, uh... oh wow. Uh... So... Uh... Ouch. David the week would hurt. That would hurt. No, I, yeah, I, I thought think too. I thought an hour was bad. Blame <laughs> some, you know, monarch from donkey's years ago for that one. Yeah, it's all pretty no, archaic, it's, right? It's 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 ridiculous. And and the, the confusing thing for me is that um, my office is um, our sister office is in Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona, and <laughs> they don't they don't have daylight savings at all. Right. In Arizona, Fun. so you know, yeah, no, so actually, uh, Wimpy, I would state it like this: they do not share the delusion that the rest of us. Yeah, share. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. The, the they opted out of that. Is not, is not so thick there. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, um, all right, okay. I mean, I mean, here's what I'm saying: the same people that believe that a laptop with one port are the same people that believe in daylight savings. So you got to make a decision. Right. What kind of person are you? Do you think a laptop should have more than uh, one port? Or do you believe in daylight? I, I'm just asking. What kind of person oh, no, are I, you? I, I, sure want, I want a laptop with together, one so. port that also charges itself. Yeah. That's what I want. What and could I want go to, wrong? I want to make sure, yeah, and I want to make sure it's a technology that I couldn't possibly already have so I can invest another 60 or 80 can, bucks into it. Yeah. Can I introduce you into the concept <laughs> of a single point of failure, please? Uh, can I? Sure. I would like to. One port goes out and nothing on your laptop works ever again. Yeah, but if, if you're going to talk about daylight savings times, there is at least two ports. <laughs> or, or th there or three. is the, there is a, there is a the fallback and spring forward port. There is actually a headphone jack that also is a microphone jack in one port, of course, because that's enough. Ooh. That's enough. Uh -huh. Styling. I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of sorry that I've I've stirred up all of these feelings again, but also delighted at the same time. He <laughs> <laughs> would have um, felt very disappointed if he had missed the uh, round completely uh, yeah no I, I, f I feel included now no, um, I just think that we can make a difference that's all and I'm, I'm willing to do it I just I just want to make sure I got everybody's but support because we got just it. For, I don't care just yeah, remind yeah, me no, I, uh, scared, but, I will definitely yeah. I will definitely support that initiative um there's one other thing Chris I don't know if you want to discuss this now or after the show oh go ahead but la last week you and I talked about uh, BT sync and 
when I listened back to it, it sounded like we were two people that weren't prepared to pay for good software because certainly from my point of view, I hadn't explained why it was I didn't want to pay for BT Sync in its future iterations. Hmm. And okay. I don't want that to come sure. across as somebody yeah. that's not prepared to pay for sure. software. I want to explain why it is BT Sync has changed and we shouldn't be supporting it. I, I, I completely agree because I think, and I'm sure you know this, Wimpy, but you know me, I'm totally willing to pay for software. Uh, in fact, I spend thousands of dollars a year on software for what we do. So uh, I would be, ha- in fact, I do. I did say I'd be willing to pay for it, but I wouldn't want to make everybody else have to sus- subscribe to use it. Yeah. So I think it's a point yeah. well made. So go ahead. I, I think clarification well, will well make. I'll explain. So prior to using BT Sync, I, I'd been a Dropbox subscriber for some years and I'd been paying my $100 and I was perfectly happy with paying for my Dropbox Dropbox subscription. So I'm not adverse to paying for software that I find useful. But in the light of the Edward Snowden revelations and then more so the crappity um, security at Dropbox, I decided Dropbox isn't somewhere that I wanted sensitive information. So I looked to move my data out of the centralized cloud storage platforms into something that I controlled. And albeit BitSync being proprietary, it offered me this peer-to-peer synchronization facility safeguarded from central organization. And also the torrent system is actually pretty great at distributing a lot of types of files like this. Uh, So it also has the advantage of being a very good way to distribute media files and things like that. Yeah, And and it worked for me. But here's the thing. It's not the cost. The cost is just one aspect, but it's a very small part. For them to enforce you paying for this, so first of all, in their press release, they know how much data has passed through the BT Sync yeah. network not in the, f- the last 18 months. That's not the first so, time they've quoted that number either, and I've always wondered, how can no. they know that? Exactly. How do they know how much data has passed through their network? More worrying is uh, you now need to subscribe per user. Now, per user subscription, that means there must be some central authority that you're logging in with. And therefore, where is your data going and how are they coalescing this? And more worrying still is you're limited to 10 folders. So again, there must be some central place that knows what all of your folder shares are in order to determine whether or not you are under or over their threshold. It could be possible. What do you think about the possibility that um, the local server does a check and says, am I authorized, yes or no, and do I have more than 10 folders, yes or no? And it could just be as simple as, if yes, I have more than 10 folders and am authorized as no, then don't function. If it was that simple, wouldn't they just tell you that? And that's a perfectly great piece of pseudocode analysis, but it's proprietary software and we just don't know. We just don't don't know, know, do we? We don't know how they're doing it, do we? Yeah, exactly. So in the light of not knowing how they're enforcing the user accounts and the folder limitations, I'm now looking at the data that I've got stored in there, which includes baby photographs and photographs of all of the children in the family. And as a father, you will know that children under the age of four take off all their clothes (laughs) all the time. And therefore, you take (laughs) photographs of naked children. And now who's analyzing the flesh tone coverage analysis in your photographs and all the rest of it. So consequently, it doesn't fly for me anymore. I need to find something that I know is open source because I can check it and i know it's not going through some third party uh, orchestration my, uh, server my uh, my so my i've always suspected that uh, the BitTorrent sync isn't doing any kind of data analysis because it would be pretty overt if uh, if a copy of your data was going to them but i have suspected for a while based on other observations 
that they are doing some sort of metadata analysis. Well, we're all pretty familiar that, that metadata is pretty damn important too. And that doesn't make me super comfortable, but it's not a deal breaker because let's be honest, it's probably less than say what Dropbox or what Google Drive for God's sakes or even Microsoft's yeah. OneDrive is doing, right? BitTorrent Sync is probably still the lesser of the evil of all of those things. Or so I would Absolutely. tell myself. What really burned my ass, and I am so tired of this because, you know, honestly, I've been, I've been watching this kind of BS for a really long time and I and and Google is a master of it but they do it in a more subtle way but what really burned me was sort of when they stuck their tongue in my ear about open sourcing it a little bit and they went mm, right yeah I might do that I might open little source this. Yeah. I might yeah exactly and then just walked away and, all right yeah well yeah uh, Hey, you got more than ten folders sorry about that and and then the oh the open source thing yeah we've totally dropped that and that I'm so sick of that. I'm so sick and tired of that bait and switch. That's the part that upset me. Forty dollars, that's pretty reasonable because you know I've subscribed to Dropbox Pro because we also use that for media files. So forty dollars is pretty reasonable, but I can't expect every unfilter uh, supporter to also pay that. So I have to. No. I really have to think. I have to think this. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, I I agree. I think I think the bait and switch thing is is a a very good point. But yeah. um, my my concerns are more more around how do they know how are they monitoring how are right. they tracking this right. and therefore now it's definitely not going to be open source how can we trust it yeah and uh, for everybody listening that said all along i told you you shouldn't use it if it's not open source well you were right well and see for me i utilize technologies that aren't open source and that potentially i'm pumping data through i generally speaking i will only pump stuff out that i want people listening or viewing yeah so podcast yeah. i hey you know what if the nsa wants to listen to my show that's freaking awesome <laughs> awesome you guys are bored yeah, you're staring at matrix yeah yeah just go listen to you're watching matrix screens and stuff yeah good exactly so that's cool but outside of that anything personal some stuff i won't even put on computer i mean like just point blank i won't Bam, just because you don't know hey oh yeah, so. matt Hey, and you know what? On you that know what? note, I'm just getting selfie shots. You know, I don't want to put that out. I, I don't want to hear about that Wayne. Selfies. We're going to start that note. We're going to start the show. It's going to be great. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's just sitting around and waiting for the damn internet of hat things. My name is Chris. And my name is Matt. I'm telling you, Matt, screw the watches, screw the phones. I want my hat internet connected. Think about all of that space you could use for battery. The rim could be used for sensors. You could have easily a couple of cameras. Dude, some some hats could have a 360 degree camera assembly, right? You nice. see, I like where you're going with Can this. we get off Google Glass? Can we get off the watching? Can we please folks? Not only that, who doesn't look good in a hat? Everybody looks good in a hat. Ladies right. look good in a hat. Guys look good. Hold on, I'm gonna grab a hat. Hold on, Matt. I, you know what? <laughs> gonna gonna do a hat. Thing. I'm gonna grab a hat for the rest of the episode. I'm gonna wear a hat. There you go. Um, guess what? I'm All doing right. unplugged in a hat, Matt. This is let's we're we're gonna go into the future. This is my internet hat of things. And on this episode, I'm gonna just have Google Docs sort of projected into my eyes because my hat of Internet of Things has snap down glasses. Because why not? Because it's got battery capacity for that. And I'll tell you what we're gonna talk about. Uh, there's an upcoming distribution that promises to make it easy to game on Linux. And then it's from folks you may have heard of before. We're going to talk about that. Also, uh, it's not Wayland. It's not Mir. No, ladies and gentlemen, a brand, brand new way to do graphics on the Linux desktop coming to you by Google. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about Freon a little bit in this episode. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Wait, 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 did you say it was called Leon? No, Freon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, I yeah. would have gone with Leon because then it's more recognizable. Hey, like, you oh, know, yeah, man, I'm running Leon. It's you okay. know how we have this open source thing called Wayland that's a protocol yeah. that you could just kind of use? Uh, well, let's just say uh, if it's not invented here, you're never going to use it. And uh, then yeah. we'll move forward from there. We're going to talk about Freon. That's coming up later in the show today. Uh, we actually have, I'm really excited about today's Unplugged. It's a good smattering of uh, topics. And one thing I want to get into to with the mumble room is if anybody thinks this new Linux code of conduct or I'm sorry conflict resolution code that was merged into the Linux kernel during the Linux action show this Sunday I guess Linus is probably just doing that while he's watching the show uh, if we actually think it's going to help how the Linux kernel developers interact with each other and if 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 they need to change it so that'll be coming up in the show as well Matt but you know I've been trying something kind of new in the unplugged show oh, yeah? 
There is a, you know, Matt, you got to mind the gap. And between uh, Linux Action Show and Linux Unplugged, news stories develop and they change. And there is there is a gap that oftentimes a couple of stories get dropped that just don't make it into any one of the shows. And so I've been trying to pick those things up and bring them to the forefront. Now, one I think we're going to talk about more later on Sunday is Ozone OS. I think that's how you say it, or Ozone, Ozone uh, right? It's from Ozone. the folks behind the Numix project and, of course, the Nitrix project, designed to get you into a simple, sleek, and modern desktop and get stuff done quickly. It is, if the Numix guys could make a desktop, well, guess what? Wow. They have, and this is what it would look like. Remember, Matt, they teased it on our interview with them during the Linux Action Show that they're going to be working right. on it. Yeah. Well, here it is. Uh, the latest OS release is called Hydrogen. It's based on Fedora 21. It uses GNOME Shell uh, 3.14, customized with their own extensions to make it a unique experience. It ships with a gorgeous GTK theme, shell icons, the whole thing. So you got the GTK theme, you have a shell theme, and an icon theme to make the whole thing freaking gorgeous. They have the dock wow. down on the bottom, uh, and oh, oh, they have a YouTube video, and you know what that means. Chris got to play that YouTube video. <laughs> Let's see what we can. Hey, Matt, when there's a new t- I got I to gotta play. Oh, yeah, we got some music. Adam Desktop, a simple, fast app storage by usage, so your more frequent apps come up to the front. Comes with Chrome. Uh, they're using, obviously, a very nice theme, so files looks like a very nice file manager. The icons are gorgeous, I'm not going to lie. It's very uh, white. Oh, it looks like they have a software center in here, Matt. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. It's their own. Oh, okay. wow. There's slight transparency in the menu. So, like, you know, they have the uh, client side decorations, but there's a slight transparency in them. The icons are just gorgeous. Yeah. Wow. You know, this might be the kind of. This is a fedora I could use. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it definitely looks great. I, oh, my gosh. So, the Google Play. Oh, oh okay. All right. I'm. All right, so I think, uh, yeah, I'm going to give this a download and give it a try. Yeah. Huh. I mean, from a visual, like, just first impressions point of view, it's really, really cool. I am impressed by um, it. No, I really am yeah. impressed by this. I think this looks really good. I am really yeah. impressed that they... Because So here's the thing, is uh, what I was huh. worried about when they first talked about it, although they kind of corrected it pretty soon, is I was worried they're going to go off and do something on their own. And uh, you and I have sort of lamented during our Fedora reviews... Like, why is nobody building an amazing distribution based off Fedora? Like, you have right. a million distributions based off Ubuntu and Debian, and uh, nothing based off Fedora or OpenSUSE of merit. I mean, there are some now, like Corora, which is great, but Corora is essentially Fedora. This right. is this is true. This is not quite as hardcore, but this is nearly uh, elementary OS meets Fedora. It's not as hardcore as that, but it's close to that. That to me is a very compelling use of Fedora as a very good base. Technologically, it has a lot of good features. It's pretty cutting edge, but it's got a lot of rough edges. You throw this on top of it and you make it ready to play Steam games. I think it's kind of so. Here's the thing. Okay, here's what, haven't you, whenever you get asked, hey, I would like to try out Linux and I want to be able to play some games, your default answer always is, okay, well, you should probably try out Ubuntu. And in the back of your mind, you're going, gosh, but I don't know, like, you know, they're about to switch up the Unity desktop environment to this whole new thing and the next update could be really weird and I'm not sure if I'm putting you on a path that you're not going to be entirely happy with. And there's these other distros that spin off of Ubuntu called Ubuntu Mate, but they're still kind of, uh, you know, attached at the hip to this main distribution that I'm not so sure where this is going. And there's this other distribution called Fedora that's connected to this Red Hat company that I'm pretty sure is a good long-term bet. And I would really like to be able to recommend this to you, but I, for God's sakes, can't give you to just go try out Fedora. That would be it. would be horrible for a brand new user, but something that takes Fedora and makes it presentable and user friendly, but lets you use a distribution that is based off something from Red Hat, that's something I would have a little more confidence in recommending to a new user once it has some more development time. I would agree with that. And one thing I need to refresh on is I need to re-examine where we're at as far as package availability for a lot of the, the specialty proprietary apps that I use uh, most most distinctly, um, see where that's at and how easy it is to get to. But if it, from what I'm seeing, though, it kind of looks like it's all just right there in a software center-like environment. Um, it looks like the nicest Fedora yeah. I've ever seen. I you know I think it might be a really it's something I'm gonna ha- I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to download it. That's just what it is. I mean, there's just no way around it. All right, Rotten Corpse, what do you think? <laughs> well, it's actually really nice looking, and it's and I'm a I'm a gnome fan, and I like how they're using 
extensions to expand on GNOME rather than trying to fork it or something. Uh, mm -hmm. The only problems that they're, they've done a few things, tweaks that are kind of odd. Like, for example, when you uh, open up the application launcher, there's no categories, there's no folders. It's just you have frequency of use of applications and that's it. You don't mm. have any choices. And then you have to search for anything else? Yeah, you have to search for everything. And the pop, like, if you look at the screenshot, it just shows like the most uh, the most yeah. frequently used, yeah. and it has really no order whatsoever. Well, that could be a um, one point oh, or this is a beta. I mean, that could be something they add. But yeah, that is a little that's a little odd. I'll, I'll grant you that. I could see though well, how for a lot of users that would be kind of nice. But if it's not pre-populated with some basics, that could be very confusing too. Yeah, this it's, it's true, a pretty yeah. cool dis uh, distro. It looks it looks pretty awesome. I, I like how they're replacing. Um, Shotwell with Gthumb because they're actually you know being up to date now, whereas Shotwell is pretty mm. slow and and updating. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I the only application they chose that's kind of weird is the Tomahawk se selection because Tomahawk's cool in theory. They have like a lot of broken stuff, and I've actually kind of like talked with the Tomahawk people, and they are working on a lot of different things that eventually it will be awesome. Right now, it's still in like you know beta stage. What do you think about mm. this? Uh, what do you think about calling it the Atom Desktop instead of calling it like uh, GNOME Plus or something? Is that uh, is it is that taking it? Well, I guess if this is early days, maybe they have intentions to go further. Perhaps that's what they're implying. Well, I think they're they're calling it the Atom Desktop because all of their they're calling every single extension they make Atom something. So maybe they just think that it's the Atom Desktop is GNOME plus all the add-on add add add-ons. It's interesting they do things like top icons by default. I think it's a pretty smart bet doing the extension route because if you look at the if the trajectory of GNOME right now, for example, uh, GNOME 3.16 is looking really, really good. And so for them, it's going to be minimal effort to take these modifications, theoretically, and move them to GNOME 3.16 because it's their extensions works. It's not. It's not as dramatic of a. It's not quote unquote a fork, for example. Uh, right. Even their extensions are not very extensive. Like they're they're extensive in the sense of like what they're offering, but they're not like so, uh, you know, catastrophically different that if when th when three sixteen comes out, then automatically they're broken. You can't use them anymore, and they have to rebuild everything. They're they're changing things like they're they're instead of using the dock inside of the overview, they're making a dock like a, a genuine dock at the mm -hmm, bottom mm -hmm. and things like that. It, it's it seems more like it's gnome with extra polish. So uh, they are using the uh, the uh, software center, the gnome software center, as their software center. But it, it says here they're doing things like uh, they're including repos for things like uh, uh, making it easy to install codecs and various software. Um, Inside the software mm -hmm. center, so again, making Fedora a little more approachable. Like it that. also is going like to have that. RPM Fusion in it too. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to download this and give and and uh, and kick the tires because uh, I, I I have felt I have felt basically uh, for the last two releases, but really with the last release of Fedora, that it is such a it's such a great base distribution, but the project itself probably because of its affiliation with Red Hat, just they can't seal the deal to make it really approachable for users that are not. Free software crusaders, right? And, right. I think the, yes, the fact that they're agree, adding the sure. RPM Fusion includes that it's going to solve some of the proprietary issues too. So, like, so why uh, don't you like Tomahawk, Spotify, and things? Oh, Spotify, Tomahawk is awesome. Tomahawk is, is a really cool concept. But for example, um, Google Play support, like you, in their video, they mentioned that you can use Google Music. Yeah, you can. It just it's not integrated with any other service. So you're either using your local stuff or you're using your uh, Google Play Music, and that's it. You can't switch between the two, but, and you can't do but, shuffling between the two. And things but it like also that. has like Spotify. So right now, I've pretty much only been using Spotify for the last couple of weeks. As and it all, but it also has things like own cloud support, and I have a lot of music up on my own cloud server. And it's a they're it's, all separated, right? But if you could, that, that's if, the only reason I don't like it. If you can pick, if you can pick just one, you get a native desktop application that allows you to have access to these cloud music services. Well, there's also something like Clementine that does the same thing. Yeah, Clementine would have been a good choice too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, there, I like um, Tomahawk, and it's got a lot of uh, potential. And I've talked to the people who are developing it, and they said they are working on integration for all of the f different cloud music plus local. And like currently, certain there's like weird views. So like for example, you can't um, you can't shuffle through Google Play Music stuff. You can only play and like select and create your own playlist. You can't actually do any kind of shuffle mode, and that's and that's pretty weird. But uh, the like you can't like currently you can't even do a list view like you can just see just album covers you can't even say here just give me a list of all the 
stuff in my my cloud, you know, my music, Google Music account. You can't even do that. Yeah. So it's kind of like it's got a lot of potential, and I am right. looking forward to yeah. it being more like a 1.0. I love right the idea. Still- I love the idea because when, once it becomes a native GTK or whatever Linux application, you know, then things like my keyboard controls work a lot better and all kinds. I love the idea of, of taking some of these cloud uh, quote unquote services. God, I'm just using the word like it actually is a real word now. And, right. and, and, and then, you know, integrating them with a local desktop, something else real quick before we, uh, before we stop talking about ozone, also steam pre-installed chromium default nice. browser. I mean, this is this is my fedora. If I spent two days, I was gonna say three, but one to two days setting it up. RPM Fusion repos. I mean, this is my fedora. So uh, yeah, I just uh, and and it's fun because they teased it on our show. It was the first place they ever mentioned it, and now we get to see it here. Uh, so I'll have links in the show notes if you guys want to go check it out. We'll probably talk a little bit more about it. Uh, so of course it's. But what? What? Oh, <clears throat> shut, up, shut, up, shut, up, shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> shut up! No! Uh, no! Uh, Three point eighteen point eight kernel, so that way your Chrome works just fine. Hey oh. Uh, anyways, uh, and uh, also I'll link to a web update article where they did a good post on it. Um, I was gonna ask. Uh, I was hoping Popey would stop by, but uh, I don't. Anybody running the? Anybody in the mumble running the fifteen oh four betas? Once. Yep. Mm. Wimpy, you are. Oh yeah, of course yeah, you are. Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> yes, of course you are. Of course. So yeah. uh, I guess you've probably then you've made the switch over to System D. Uh, any uh, thing to report? Uh, not a lot. Um, uh, I've not had any difficulties myself. The only thing that I've noticed is that if you've previously installed and gone for full disk encryption, then. Uh, System D is slow to boot, and that's because there's a 90-second timeout <laughs> whilst it tries and fails to do cryptid swap, um, and they're working on fixing that. So that's the only, like, major, in air quotes, issue I've seen with it, but by and large, it's been a, a seamless transition. Uh, Popey did uh, post on Google Plus that uh, after his work day, uh, he uh, did the update, upstart was removed, System D was added, and all worked fine with no drama. Except wow. for the historical drama attached with the entire System D tobacco. Uh, yeah, let's not get into that. No, uh, no, no, we shouldn't. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, before we uh, continue on, I uh, I want to take a minute right now and uh, talk about our first sponsor, and that's Linux Academy. Go over to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged to get our special Linux Unplugged discount, which is unique to the Linux Unplugged show. I don't want to brag. But Linux Academy, I want to reach out specifically to the Linux audience to give you guys a special discount. And Linux Academy is an awesome resource for you to take your knowledge set to the next level. It's created by people that are truly passionate about Linux, about teaching people, about all of the categories that they cover. And that's why they're not a generic training site. They are dedicated to this. And now they've been a sponsor for a little while. I've had the opportunity to hear some really nice success stories. And that is pretty amazing when you think about what success means, right? Success, when you go to Linux Academy, means you've been able to pass a certification or you're able to get that job that you couldn't get before or maybe you did a little better on the review. Like that's the kind of success that has an impact on your life like nothing else. And that's what's really unique about Linux Academy. They have step-by-step video courses. They have comprehensive study guides. You can download and keep them. Uh, Viewer Seth, he likes to listen to some of the MP3 content in the shower. They also have live streams where you can ask the educator questions. They have scenario-based training. And what's super sweet about this is this is going to give you hands-on experience with the technology. So by the time you're done with that lab, you've actually implemented the technology you'd be working with in production. So when you go work with it in production, it's not the first time you've ever touched that. It's not the first time you've ever done that. It's not the first time you've ever read that config file. How embarrassing is that, right? No. The scenario-based training, you actually go implement that technology end from end. And for me... Because Amazon Web Services was an entirely new beast that was of its own and total creation, unlike anything else. I was a little intimidated by that. The fact that I could go over to Linux Academy and wrap my brain around using S3 and using the AWS mailing services and using their DNS and really kind of wrap my brain around how all of those things can work together so that way when I go to talk about it, it's not the first time I've ever seen it. That was, that was critical for me. 
Go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Get our 33% discount and get started. I have a great success story right here. Thank you, Linux Academy by Mike K. I just landed the job of my dreams at a hosting company as a Linux administrator. I can't thank you guys enough. Also, I want to give a shout out to the guys over at Jupiter Broadcasting. If it wasn't for the Linux Action Show and Linux Unplugged, I never would have known about Linux Academy. That's pretty cool. Linuxacademy.com awesome. slash unplugged. Yeah, Matt. I mean, that's that's seriously the coolest thing ever. That's amazing. Yep, go check it out. It's really a great resource. Uh, uh, I'm using it now. Uh, my wife, Angela, is using it as well. Uh, Michael Dominic from Coda Radio, he has the team pass, so that way his team can use it. Linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Okay. So uh, I got a few things I want to talk to you guys about. Um, do you guys, uh, this would have been a great topic for TechSnap, but we pre-recorded this week. And so I thought, well, since it's Linux related, uh, I'm going to be a little selfish. I'll go ahead and grab it for the Linux Unplugged show. You guys you may be familiar about Project Zero. We've talked about it on the TechSnap show before. It's this initiative by Google to try to crack... Um, well, in the most case, open source projects. But it's not because they hate open source. It's because they want to try to find the bad stuff before, like, state actors or malware authors do. And so uh, it turns out they've been able to do a pretty devastating attack against Linux. Uh, you're not going to believe how they did it. And especially you laptop users are susceptible to it. If you're on a desktop, you're not as susceptible to this attack. Get this. The technique dubbed as Rowhammer, rapidly writes and rewrites to memory to force capacitor errors in DRAM, which can be exploited to gain control of the system by repeatedly recharging one line of RAM cells. Bits in an adjacent line can be altered, thus corrupting the data stored. The corruption can lead to the wrong instructions being executed or control structures that govern how memory is assigned to program being altered. The latter case can be used by a normal program to gain kernel-level privileges. The Project Zero team has now built two working exploits that successfully hijack control of many x86 computing systems running Linux. As they say, they could do the same with other operating systems as well, but they're kind of focused on trying to find flaws in open source software to make open source more secure. The proof of concept exploit code flips bits in RAM to alter the page tables for a process, allowing an attacker to gain access to all physical RAM, including the kernel's memory space. From this point, memory protection mechanisms and other security measures can be completely bypassed, and structures within the operating system tampered with within to take over the machine. Now, here's this. How great is this? The team tested the exploit on 29 x86-based laptops built between 2010 and 2014 using DDR3 RAM. In 15 cases, the team could successfully subvert the systems within minutes and found the DRAM made by a variety of manufacturers is susceptible to the attack. Here's the interesting part, though. While there was a high cracking rate, the team reported almost no success on desktop machines. This is possibly because those computers news use newer RAM. Maybe some of those computers were using ECC RAM, with error correcting, of course, uh, which makes Rohammer attacks on the kernel much harder to accomplish. Or maybe that laptops are just denser and lower power, uh, so they're easier to corrupt. And then, and then this article goes on to talk about a bunch of other really interesting things, but they say the Google team also said newer firmware versions, like just to the BIOS, the change how the CPU and the memories controller re, uh, like just talk, like how fast they refresh the RAM, reduce the effectiveness of this of Rohammer attack too. Uh, not completely though, just kind of in most cases made it take longer. The team has released the code on GitHub <laughs> and can be used to test Linux and Mac OS systems for the vulnerability. And uh, in the article I link in the show notes, that GitHub code is linked. So if you want to test your machine, if you want to go all Project Zero, uh, here's the Rohammer test code. Right there on GitHub. Yikes! <laughs> I, I almost want wow. to do it, but then like you don't I, want to know. No, I mean, you do, but you don't. You really don't. I right. mean, like, right. You want to do it on someone else's machine, especially someone you don't like. Right. Like yeah. if it's like a client that's like a real bear or something, do it on their machine. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> I just don't. I just don't. I don't. I don't want to be hacked. Like when yeah, you hear I that kind either. of stuff, you're like, oh boy, there's nothing I can do. There's just exactly. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. Just like, there's uh, no way you could ever prevent anything from uh, avoiding that. Windows, Linux, Mac. Yep. Anything that has the permissions in RAM, to, exactly. you know, even the no execute bit, those are by pages in the RAM of the computer. Yeah, well, it's not, even though it's enabled by the CPU, they're all based in the RAM, so you can just flip bits no matter what, regardless of the operating system. 
I was uh, talking about a story on Tech Talk today, uh, 142, I think it was today. And uh, we were talking about how the CIA has had a multi-year effort underway to crack iOS devices. And I was, you know, I was kind of uh, thinking about, like, that. that is just like a, a, a pretty nasty situation where they have gotten to the point where if, if they cannot crack your encryption, if they cannot crack your, crack your password or whatever it is, they will take an iPhone and they will watch the electrical use and frequency of the CPU as it does encryption. And from that, can reverse engineer some keys to crack the encryption. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, if my foe is somebody who can take my phone and put it in a sensor grid and watch the electrical output of my CPU from afar and then somehow reverse engineer the encryption from that, there's not a lot I'm going to be able to do. There's nothing you can do about that. And there's, there's no point in worrying about that. Yeah, you can leak information in pretty much most ways. That's why a lot of things try to be deterministic or never allow variation in the operations that it actually performs. If everything is consistent, it'll be impossible, or at least as impossible as designed or architected. But it's very rarely that perfect. Software has bugs. Yeah, and people are buggy. Yes, they are. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I wanted to just do a follow-up. Uh, something that broke kind of between the Linux Action Show and now that has really gotten out of control is this big hoopla around, and I started to see it brew, and I, I'm like, no way, what's going on here? During Before 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 we went on the Earth Linux Action Show, decided not to run with the story, and then it just exploded. Like, people are all upset. Google is dropping support for every version of Linux before version 3.16. How dare Google? Chrome is is, is going to be completely unusable on, on, on LTSs. Like, just all of this outrage. And I, I was like, well, well, what is going on here? Well, okay, okay. All right, it turns out um, just mislabeling the bug <laughs> has caused all of this major confusion and outrage on forums all across the Internet over the weekend. You might not have even heard about this if you weren't paying too close of attention because it happened so damn fast. A few days ago, it appeared that Google began requiring new versions of the Linux kernel in order to use Chrome or Chromium. Now it appears Google intends to continue to support older versions of the Linux kernel, but they're hitting a bug. It appeared with modern versions of Google's Chrome and Chromium web browsers. It seems to be that there was a dependency on version 3.17 or newer of Linux. Otherwise, when dealing with Chrome or Chrome extensions, the user would get error messages. It turns out that Google intended for there to be didn't intend for there to be a hard requirement on version 3.17. A Chromium developer commented on the bug and said, "I'm updating the title." so that people who have been misled into thinking that non-TSYNC kernels were deprecated immediately understand that it's simply just to some unknown bug that are hitting some users and they're continuing to work on it. So if you read that Chrome will no longer work on your version of Ubuntu because you have the 13, you have the 3.13 kernel or something like that, or 3.16 kernel, never fear. Chromium is not going away. I just I couldn't I believe that. This is just another example of why Firefox is awesome. Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's where we go with it. I mean, oh I don't mind God. Firefox, but for God's sakes. Hey, Wimpy, are you uh, are you awake? Are you still around? Oh, yeah, I'm awake. Just. Yeah. Are you okay? Are you okay, Wimpy? Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. All it's right. all good here. Go, I, go I have an email that I, I think you are the perfect person to answer. So, Zek the Penguin oh, writes Oh, crikey. In. I know. <laughs> I know. Question about uh, Mate and the pie. Hi, guys. Glad to be getting in touch again. I listened to Unplug this week and was wondering if anybody's tried Ubuntu Mate on the Raspberry Pi. By the way, did you know there's a Pi 2 out now? Holy crap! I suppose this question might be more for the mumble room, but here it is. I've noticed there has been no mention of Ubuntu TV for some time. I've looked around. What's the deal on that? Stay frosty. Zach the Penguin. So I'll get to the Ubuntu TV thing in a sec, but uh, Wimpy, anything uh, to share on Ubuntu Mate and the Raspberry Pi? Okay, on the Raspberry Pi, you know, the original versions, there'll be no Ubuntu on those models because Ubuntu don't build for ARM v6. Uh, they only build for ARM v7. But if you've got a Raspberry Pi 2, then somebody in the Ubuntu Mate community ported Ubuntu Mate 15.04 
to the Raspberry Pi a couple of days ago. Ah. So that's available now. And I've had preliminary conversations with some of the Ubuntu devs that are responsible for Ubuntu Snappy Core to get some advice as to how we might be able to make that an official image. And they've mm. given us some really cunning advice about just creating a root file system for ARM v7 hard float and then the instructions on how you then integrate a bootloader and a kernel for any other ARM v7 platform into that root file system so you can effectively enable that for a multitude of ARM v7 devices. So we're looking at that. But if you've got a Raspberry Pi 2, there's an Ubuntu Mate 1504 image available for you now, which ah. is well ahead of the schedule as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I was pretty surprised when I saw that on Google+. Plus. Good yes, work, pretty great. Good pretty work. great. Well, no, no, I tell you what, I can't take any no. credit. This, uh, And I wish I could pronounce <laughs> the uh, community member's name, but it's got far too many letters that I can't string together <laughs> in it. So um, <laughs> I'm just going to say thank you and you know who you are. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty neat. And you know what? It makes a lot of sense for the Raspberry Pi, especially this new one that's supposed to be much faster. It makes it me sound – It makes it, honestly, it makes it sound like it could be used as a full-fledged desktop. What's oh, the definitely. Wimpy? Have you gotten any well, reports back on the performance? Uh, good enough that you can use LibreOffice in it. Good. Well, nice. I mean, that's that's, that's pretty big. That's I mean, one of the like, What's it like in a browser? Yeah. That's what. I, that's really what comes down for me. Yeah, if it's yeah. Reasonably YouTubeable, you know. Then cool. Uh, yes, yeah, so long as you're using HTML5 rather than Flash, that all works too. There's, Seems reasonable. Uh, we haven't quite the, the the guy the guy that's looking at this hasn't quite figured out the. Um, uh, the accelerated video yet, but I think that's just a matter of time. And uh, we're also looking at the Odroid C1 as well. Ooh. Very nice. nice. That's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. Oh, Wimpy, I always love getting the updates. I feel like I get the inside scoop. It's great. I know, right? Uh, so, Zach the Penguin, I hope that answers your question. Sounds like that might be an area to play around with. And Oh, man, now you're making me want a Pi 2. So if anybody out there in the audience ends up trying it out on a Pi 2, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact, and tell me your thoughts. Or maybe, you know, we've all got phones with cameras now. Why the hell aren't some of you taking more videos? And then just yeah, upload right. that to YouTube and email that into the show. I'd like you to can actually do it from see, the phone. I, I want to see how it works. How does it function? How well does it work? That's what I want to know. So uh, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact, and you'll find the Linux Unplugged show in the drop down, or you can submit to linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Hey, before we run too far, I know I've mentioned a lot. I don't mean to be obnoxious, but I just really want to see you. I want to meet you. I want to shake your hand at Linux Fest Northwest 2015. I know it's a long ways to go, but let me tell you the United States of America, we've got like more than 20 states. We do. Yeah, like a lot more than 20 <laughs> states. <laughs> and you know what, Matt? Maybe you would tend to disagree, but tell me, Washington, it's one of the best, isn't it? Oh, it's, I've been to a few of them um, yeah. up and down the, uh, the area. I've been way up north, way down south. And I would say Washington is definitely, both weather-wise and culture-wise, is just chill. It's very relaxed. Yeah, Washington, very cool. Washington's the best state out of all of them. Absolutely. And so that's why uh, we want you to come to Linux Fest Northwest, because one of the best places in Washington is Bellingham, Washington. I mean, that's there's right. Seattle, and they have a Space Needle, and they have sports there. But you know what they don't have? The true, genuine hippie culture of Washington. That's up in Bellingham. <laughs> it's so true, right? too. <laughs> so, growing up in Bellingham for a good portion of my years, yes, that's actually accurate. Yeah. So if you it really, really want to know what Washington's about, you come to Bellingham. <laughs> if you want to know what we want you to think Washington's about, you go to Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yes. Now you got it. Now you got it. So uh, it's April oh, 25th and 26th. Uh, we're going to try to get as much of the crew out there as possible. Uh, we really want to go big this year. Uh, and so that means, you know, we're going to be flying. We're going to be flying folks out we're going to be having uh some big uh, after parties and things like that and along to go with that we've launched a new shirt if you go to teespring.com slash linux we've only sold 38 uh, we need to get to 150 to even meet goal and at that we won't even be covering our linux fest northwest cost not even a little bit uh we we would have to probably sell a lot more than that because we're selling the t-shirt specifically near cost but if you could go over to teespring.com slash linux grab yourself some swag you've got that we've got the long sleeve shirt we've got the hoodie this will support our linux fest northwest efforts we've also got the ladies tee you can go grab that over there as well as the kids tee uh which is look at that 13 dollars for the kids tee uh 17 for the t-shirt that's our cost 
So if you if you really want to make sure we get there, I'm not even joking. You might want to buy two. Uh, we set it low because we really want as many folks wearing the swag as possible. Uh, right now, the number one color seems to be this nice blue, which I'm not gonna lie, does look really good. And you know what? Pro tip. Uh, you're Chris, you're Chris right here. You this guy, this me, me. I, I had your back when we designed the new Linux Action Show logo for episode 300. We knew what was up. We'd actually gotten our crap together by that point, and we decided let's make sure that this will print well on a shirt. So we've designed the Linux Action Show logo for episode 300 and forward specifically to make sure that when we do swag, it prints well. And my friends, it does. This is the only black and white run of the Linux Action Show logo that we have done, and we are trying to raise funds for our cover of Linux Fest Northwest. You can get it at teespring.com slash Linux. And we have only sold a meager 38 so far, not even reaching the goal. Uh, and, well, and the idea is once we raise the funds, then we're going to be able to afford things like flying out guys like Rotten Corpse and Q5Sys and uh, Chris Moore and Alan Jude and Michael Dominic. And like, could you imagine how much it costs to fly all of those people out and put them up in a hotel room? Can you imagine? It's got to be well, like two thousand dollars a person. So there's and that's no with way. That's us doing uh, Alan as, cr- as freight. I mean, we did. Yeah. I think that's what we did that one year, right? Yeah. We just popped him out of a crate. So but yeah, I mean, it'd be nice. Right now, thirty-eight shirts is not going to do it. That's for <laughs> no. sure. That's for damn sure. Uh, and I, I, even if we sold a thousand, we'd probably only still cover only a part of it. But anything we could do could help. Plus, then you get some awesome swag. Even if you're not going to the fest, you can still get a great shirt. And the logo does look good. And I have found, for some reason, that rocket seems to start conversations. And then if you are clever, you segue that conversation into a discussion about Linux and software freedom. And I know that sounds like stupid, but you'd actually be surprised how often that has happened. Uh, I'm not even kidding. I went and got my hair cut today, and I'm wearing uh, the Unfilter uh, uh, shirt. And like somebody's like, Unfilter? What's that? And I'm like, oh, well, let me tell you. And it's a great opportunity <laughs> to also uh, to, to plug the uh, the network. So anyways, that's my super long way of saying uh, Linux Fest Northwest 2015 is coming up. And they've just today opened up early registration. You can go register right now. Uh, and uh, if you want to be a, if you want to register for free, you can. Or if you want to toss in to them, you get a T-shirt, and at sixty bucks, and it, it helps support the Linux Fest Northwest as well. It's a great. Uh, we go to all of them, you know. And I got to tell you, it's one of the best in the U.S. of A. And if you've ever considered coming to United States Linux Fest, not only are you going to get a great test of a great taste of one of the best states in the United States of America. You'll also get exposed to some great barbecue, some great JB experiences, and get a great fest at the same time. That's right. Man, I tell you what, man, I made myself want to go now, and I already want to go. <laughs> well, you know, and I think two important things to realize, too, is one, if you have a shirt on, we know, we know you're with us. Boom. Inst- that's important. The second thing is if, you're, if you are coming up, do the hotel thing now. Don't wait till don't yeah. wait till April. Don't yeah. wait till a few days before. Trust me, you're going to get a better experience if you do it now. You that's know. A- Really, really important. The thing is, and this is why the shirt is so important, is uh, last year, uh, I think there was about 1,300, 1,400 attendants to Linux Fest Northwest. And I think about 700 of those attendants were wearing Jupiter Broadcasting swag. (laughs) So we got to do it again this year. We cannot go down in numbers, right? We got to make a sea of Linux action show. Uh, And uh, and, and that that, there's one clear reason to do that, because the more shirts that are, say, Linux action show, the more interviews we're going to get. Come on, let's be honest. No, I don't know. That's it. All that right. Helps. So anyways, teespring.com slash Linux. Uh, why not? I say it's a good looking logo if I don't say so myself. I'll tell you what else is great. Our first, or actually, our, I'm sorry, our second sponsor this week, and that's DigitalOcean. And uh, DigitalOcean is all in on Linux. So uh, when the uh, Linux kernel developers create a code of conduct, they're probably paying attention. And when CoreOS came onto the scene, they were also paying attention. That's why they scrambled to work with the CoreOS project directly, so that way they could get subscribed to the development channel, so that way they get official updates directly from the project. I love it. They truly get it. They get community. They they get open source, they get Linux, and they understood that if they were going to have a compelling product, it, they couldn't just have a great UI. That's pretty obvious if you look at their website. They've got the best in the business, clearly. But they also knew they needed to build it on top of incredible technology, state-of-the-art ba- bandwidth and data centers, and really, let's be honest, Linux. Right, It's Linux and KVM that makes DigitalOcean possible. And it's that fact that they use Linux and KVM is why I use DigitalOcean, because I have faith in that infrastructure. I have faith in that setup. And that's one of the reasons why I'm happy using them as sort of my back-end infrastructure every time we have to spin up a Jupyter Broadcasting server. It kind of took me a little while to really wrap my brain around this idea because at first I kind of thought, oh, this is my VPS. 
You know, I need right, to go. I need right. to go do a thing. I'll have. I'll go spin up a VPS. Now I think of them as my server room. Like when 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 somebody comes to me and says, "Chris, we're going to have to do this thing, like you know, dedicated video streaming or a new type of Ruby on Rails things to manage our chat room." Like I don't think of anything other than DigitalOcean now. Like that is my server room because it's so easy to get started. It is simple, intuitive. And it's very fast. You can start in less than 55 seconds. And pricing plans start at only $5 a month. That's going to get you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. If you're just starting out, we just did our production on Linux episode of the Linux Action Show. If you're just starting out your podcast, just host your files on a DigitalOcean droplet. I wish this was available when I started. Oh, no kidding, If data right? center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London, so you could have multiple, like, for, like, 15 bucks, you could have, like, essentially worldwide distribution. Man, I love that. Again, with blogging, too. Like, I wish this was available when blogging became a thing. It's so nice. But at that interface, it's crazy intuitive, and Power users can replicate the interface with DigitalOcean's API, and the community has already done that a bunch. There's a great a ton of apps. Just, you can go out, great, a ton of great apps you can just go out there and take advantage of like right now in the Google Play Store for your Android device, in the iOS Store for your Apple, but really just all kinds. like this, it, The whole spectrum from Bash applications to Ubuntu applets to puppets, the plugins. I mean, it's, it's the full spectrum, and there's new ones being developed all of the time. Why? Because the API is actually really good. It's really good. And so the development community, and there's a really passionate community, the same thing, you see the same thing in DigitalOcean's tutorials community, they get passionate about it because they've given them the tools. They've given them a reasonable value and so much to work with. That's what DigitalOcean's all about. Go create an account and use our promo code DO Unplugged, one word, lowercase, DO Unplugged. Just go spin up a server for free when you use DO Unplugged. You can try it out for two months for free, the $5 rig, and go update the packages. Seriously, just go update the packages and sit back and go, wow, wow. It's like your computer is hooked up to the matrix. It is like a direct feed to the matrix. It's so damn fast. And they have one-click deployments. You can deploy like GitLab or Docker or Ghost or WordPress, Ruby on Rails with one click. And they've been all in on Docker since day one, so they have a bunch of great stuff around that. They've just recently launched free BSD supports. If you want to kick the tires on that, you absolutely can. Just use our promo code DO Unplugged. You get a $10 credit. You can spin up a $5 rig two months for absolutely free. Go over to DigitalOcean.com. DO Unplugged when you check out, or just apply it to your account. That's how they do it. It's really slick. Try it out. DigitalOcean.com. And a big thanks, DigitalOcean, for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged show. I love it. I love it all the time. I love it a little bit inappropriately, to be honest with you. <laughs> I spend entirely too much time in my droplets. I'm always coming up with something, so it's really cool. Now, uh, I guess uh, Linus kind of has a reputation. You know, he's kind of known for no, uh, no. being a little tough. The Linux development mailing list is known for calling it as it is. It's been, a bit of a, it's been a bit of a point of discussion for the last year or so. I'm not actually totally sure why. It feels like if you don't like it, just don't participate. Yeah, but that'd be my. You know, it's gotten to the point, though, Matt, where it's just not going away. Mm. You know, I honestly, yeah, and, and I guess it really depends on, now, if there's enough people that are bothered by it, then it can become a thing. But I think if it's just one or two, you know, it, it, it's really kind of up in the air. Um, I, For myself personally, I don't see an issue. Yes, he comes off like a raving lunatic sometimes. That's fine. You can do it right back to him, and it's all good. <laughs> as, you know, as long as things are, you know, I just don't see it as that big of a thing. But I know a lot of people are really really upset by it and uh you know maybe they need a code of conduct i i don't know that's something they're gonna have to determine so uh friend of the show <laughs> greg kh uh submitted a patch to the linux kernel during the linux action show uh and he said uh, and, and here i'll cover that in a second but uh, the idea is to make the linux mailing uh, linux kernel mailing list maybe a bit more peaceful they've uh they're going to adopt a code of conduct uh, the title, uh, I don't know if I'd call it quite a code of conduct. I don't think that's quite the right title. It's more like a method to resolve conflicts. Like, for example, in it they say, the Linux kernel development effort is a very personal process compared to traditional ways of developing software. Your code and ideas behind it will carefully be reviewed, often resulting in critique and criticism. The review will almost require, will almost always require improvements to the code before it can be included to the kernel. Know that this happens because everyone involved wants to see the best possible solution for the overall success of Linux. This development process has been proven to create the most robust operating system kernel ever, and we do not want to do anything to cause the quality of submission and eventual result to ever decrease. Now, Matt, 
I'm not a corporate speak master anymore, but if I were to pull out my old corporate speak, to me, that sounds like what they're codifying there is attitude. Essentially, what they're saying oh, yeah. is this process has attitude, and if you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. Do you disagree? That's exactly what it is. They just they were lacking synergy and focus, but otherwise, they nailed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. And then uh, before we jump in too much further... Uh, the new code, which was made by a via a Linux kernel patch, continues. If, however, anyone feels personally abused, threatened, or otherwise uncomfortable due to this process, that is not acceptable. If so, please contact the Linux Foundation's Technical Advisory Board or the individual members, and they will work to resolve the issue to the best of their ability. As a reviewer of code, please strive to keep things civil and focused on the technical issues involved. We are all humans. And frustrations can be high on both sides of the process. Try to keep in mind the immortal words of Bill and Ted. Be excellent to each other. <laughs> I like that. That's I like amazing. That. Yeah, you that's know, in the I'm Linux, okay with it. That's amazing. That's that's incredible. It, th actually. That's a very good way of putting it. I'm I'm okay with it from the fact that I think it's important that it doesn't come down to uh, sexist comments or you know ra racial slurs and things like that. That that's not okay. But I think if you're just calling someone a dumbass or it's like pull your head out of your backside and pay attention, you stupid fool or what you know that's whatever. That that's not pointing toward any one group of people. That's just basically hating on anyone that did something stupid. You know, I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, all right. So the Linux Foundation uh, yeah. tuned in with their uh, with uh, their thoughts on it. But before I go any further, uh, Wimpy or anyone in the mumber room, anything jump to you? Uh, is this going to even work? Can the Linux kernel team have a code of conduct? Well, I like the fact it's called a code of conflict. I think that that's uh, <laughs> that's, that's uh, <laughs> the best the best title for it, given where it's been placed. Right. Um, and yeah. The Linux kernel development's kind of famous for its occasional blow-ups and raucous attitude. <laughs> and is this is this now Linux kernel development growing up and getting a little bit corporate and PC and and a little bit sensible and not quite so punk and chaotic and anarchic is it like that? it used to be. Is it that, or is it codifying bad behavior as a code of conduct? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't seem to be because there's an escalation channel for if True. people are uncomfortable with how True. they've been treated. So it feels like this is... Uh, this is um, sanitizing and normalizing, you know, Linux kernel development behavior to be um, more in line with what you'd expect in uh, traditional working environments. And, and, and that's that's good and bad. It's, yeah. it's good because it, it can be more inclusive and it's bad because, well, that a little bit of the anarchy of Linux kernel development has maybe has maybe died a little bit. And maybe maybe Linux is a little bit sad. Uh, yeah, this. well, yeah, the rumor is that he was a, he was not totally, absolutely happy with it, but he is the one that committed the patch at the end of the day. Well, he, 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 would, he would be, really, wouldn't yeah. he? I mean, ultimately, um, yeah, he has, to, he has to accept these things. Isn't it funny but, yeah, that they I, did I, this I, as a patch? <laughs> that's kind of funny, right? They did this as a patch. That's, 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 that's classic. Uh, and, and that's in the <laughs> Linux kernel tree, so why not? Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I would rather have a warning sign than accidentally fall into a manhole. <laughs> having a warning, knowing <laughs> what I'm going to get into, and having it... That's fair. It almost defends their position that they can be assholes to you and yeah. be ready for it. Yeah, right. Like, you're, you're, you're stepping into the arena. Even though they're kidding or saying it up front, they're almost legitimizing it well, right and, there with and, that patch. And shouldn't... It's okay, though, because it it's be, good to have conflict, like, to it, have good feedback. Couldn't you argue that Linux kernel development is like in the top 10 most important development, software development projects of all of humanity? Because so much depends on Linux that if somebody screws something up, you literally... you I mean, you could, you could impact you lives. screw the world. Yeah. So, like... Maybe it's okay that sometimes people use kind of difficult and hard words when they're developing on one of the most important projects of our entire society's creation. I'm not saying the most, maybe, I don't know, but I'm saying it's got to be up in like the top 10, right? Like, look at the entire freaking world runs on it, right? And so it, it, it seems like from time to time, if you do something that makes that thing less good, you probably should be yelled at. 
Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. hurting uh, everyone's baby. And also, you know, if if Linux is a reflection of humanity through software development, then it should probably reflect reflect its imperfections as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. For better or worse. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, I guess this is sort of saying we're going to allow some room for that, but we're going to try to keep it semi-civil and have an official process when things get out, get out of hand. Right. That's kind of what they're saying. Does seem like it. Yeah. Colonel Linux says uh, Linus told a dev in the mailing list that he wished that he would have retroactively abort what? He didn't say Colonel. He doesn't finish the thought. <laughs> uh, the, the whole patch? Maybe. I don't know. I, I think it's no, that was the whole that was the whole comment. Hmm. That he thought he was surprised he could find his. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> very good. That's that's rather. He means he wanted him to die. Yeah, I got it now. Yeah. That's that's awful. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> should we? You know, Ouch. when Canonical announced their own display server, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but the entire internet caught on fire. At least the the lands of Linux. Uh, when when Mir was announced. I, I believe that uh, uh, it, it was the end of times, and the debate raged and continues to rage. So this week, Google announced their own display server called Freon to replace X11 on Chromebooks. Not based on Wayland, not based on Mir, their own totally invented at Google solution. And we're going to talk about it right after I mentioned Ting. Go to linux.ting.com right now to go get $25 off your first device or your service plan. And man, is Ting rocking right now. So they've rolled out the GSM to the open beta. You can get your device on the Ting network if it's GSM compatible. They just did a big post over on their blog that talks about all the different types of devices that work on the Ting network. Uh, let me just tell you, it's a lot, right? Because they got the whole CDMA spectrum now and the GSM spectrum. You just got to make sure it's the right frequencies. And they have it all laid out in a brand new blog post. Go over to linux.ting.com to get started. Then you can check on the blog to see if your device is compatible. Lots of great use cases for these devices. I've been hearing about some good ones. Kernel Linux, he's got an old Nokia device that he's using as like the bat phone that he brought back to life. It's a feature phone. It's like, okay, two people have this phone number. If it rings, I actually know that's an important phone call. Chase, right, our buddy from How To Linux on the Unfilter show, his home security system running off the Ting GSM network. Myself, I have put my, my uh, Nexus 5 on the Ting GSM network. Holy crap. Holy, holy, holy crap. I'm going to tell you about it here in a second. Nexus 5, it's so badass on the Ting network because I can switch. I can go. I can move back to the CDMA network if I want or the GSM network, which that's that's mind-blowing if you think about like the kind of flexibility that gives you. But here's the great thing about Ting. I'm only paying for what I use. It's a flat $6 a month. Now, I'm going to tell you, real talk, ladies and gentlemen, that's a game changer if you're a small business. A company like Jupiter Broadcasting, we really can't afford to do jack, but one of the things I can afford to do is give people on our team cell phones. That is huge for us. As an internet-connected company, that is extremely important, and Ting is making it possible. I just checked our Ting bill for three devices, an, uh, an iPhone 5, an HTC One, and a Nexus 5. $55 is our bill. Three smartphones, hotspot and tethering are included, all of the features. It's just $6 for the line, and then we pay for our usage. I've got three freaking high-end smartphones on my plan. I would not be able to do this as a business if it was not for Ting. Like, I would not have an option for this, and I'm only paying $55 a month. If you're a family, you can take advantage of that same savings. Go to linux.ting.com right now. Try out their savings calculator. See how much you could, sh you could save. I think you'd be pretty mad. Just shave it off. Shave it down. Shave it down. Now, let me tell you about that GSM coverage. It's going to vary. You can find out your coverage information on the Ting website, but this morning on my drive-in to work, as I was streaming, I was like, you know what? I'm doing 50 miles per hour right now. How 2015 is this? What kind of bandwidth am I going to get while I'm doing 50 miles per hour on a podunk country road? It's in Marysville, Washington. It's called 67th. And if you know what I'm talking about, this is this is a this is a in the woods road that is literally cut between farmland. That's why I take it. It's a beautiful drive. And I'm doing 50 miles per hour. I open up the speed test app. I get 18 megabits down, 17 megabits up, 31 millisecond ping while I'm driving in my truck on the Ting G GSM service. It is so awesome. And I'm only paying for what I use. Linux 
ting.com go there and support this show go try it out and also i'll give a quick plug to women's tech radio uh women's tech radio has been giving out some ting gsm cards uh if you like i think episode uh, go listen to episode 16 this is the latest episode women's tech radio uh within the first few minutes they have information you can get on the uh, you can get in for the drawing to get a free a free ting gsm sim uh, and they have information in episode 16 of women's tech radio and the reason why i tell you that i don't i mean they get the credit for it but the reason why I tell you that is game changer. It's so much fun. When I do something like this and I and, and it just totally opens up a whole new world of speed and signal and it's just it's such it's so exciting. It's such a game changer. I want you to experience it too. Go to linux.ting.com to get started. Go listen to Women's Tech Radio episode 16 to get a free GSM sim. Yes, they have a drawing. It's not going to take, you know, not much. I mean, there's there's other people are listening too, but you have a shot of getting a, they're giving out two GSM uh, 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 cards, free GSM cards per episode. So you got a good shot. And that's episode 16 of Women's Tech Radio. Anyways, go to linux.ting.com to get started. Try out the savings calculator just to get an idea of what you'd save, especially if you're a business. And if you're thinking about buying a device specifically to run on the Ting GSM network, go read their blog post about shopping for a GSM device first. A lot of good information, and it's really simple, and there's a lot of devices that work for Ting now. linux.ting.com, and a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Unplugged show. I'll tell you, I was there yesterday and watching you play with it inside, and you, mm-hmm. it's like the, the speed readouts were just like you, you showed it to me. I'm like, yeah. well, yeah, how yeah. you must be on Wi-Fi? I'm like, no, no, you're on. Your, nope. It's like you're on tickets. Like, oh my god, that's crazy. It was really cool, wasn't it? It was yeah. awesome. Yeah, and and the, you yeah. Should, and the thing really gets crazy when I'm in full signal. To it, really gets crazy. Uh, all right, so let's talk about Freon real quick. So if you haven't heard, right. uh, uh, this is uh, Google's effort to basically remove X11 dependencies. Uh, from Chrome OS altogether. Uh, Freon is not based uh, on Wayland or Mir. Freon does away with the rest of X11 dependencies and its processes aiming to provide better performance and reduced power consumption and a smaller Chrome OS binary. Within Freon, there technically is not a display server. I want to repeat that. Technically, Freon is not a display server. Under Freon driver, under the Freon driver model, the Chrome browser talk the Chrome browser talks directly to the kernel's DRM and KMS APIs, and is also communicating directly with OpenGL ES for the 3D drawing functionalities. Within Chrome OS 41, this functionality is mostly for the Intel Chromebooks, while the various Samsung ARM Chromebooks should receive similar treatment in later releases. The initial Freon supported devices include the Chromebook Pixel, the Acer C720 the Asus Chromebox, the HP Chromebox, the LG Chrome Base, the Acer Chromebox, and the Dell Chromebox. The initial limitations are due to being dependent on DRM and KMS support in the hardware. This is a new approach, though. Uh, among the benefits of Freon is supporting hardware overlays for compositing, partial screen update support, so you just update a certain area of the screen, zero copy texture uploads, external display device improvements, and reduced input in the, late, in the latency stack. Um, Sounds nice. Why didn't Google just know. use Wayland, though? Anybody in the uh, mumble room have any thoughts? Why would Google have to go invent its own system? Why not just use the Wayland protocol? Well, Google have invented their own system before. Why didn't they use Surface Flinger? Yeah, They've already got all the work done. Before they made this, they had a thing called Ozone, and they are making the Wayland and Mir abstractions built on top of ozone and ozone talks to kms and drm through right. the direct like direct not to rendering. be not to be confused with the linux distribution yes so they already have this layer called ozone so they've already got two implementations which talk directly to the kernel already they're just adding one that is a little bit less protocol or extraction yeah i mean essentially I like it sounds it, like they well, have it all decombobulated or de- decoupled already I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but it sounds like on Chrome OS, they've essentially been doing a lot of all of the heavy lifting inside Chrome and then just sending the output to X to just draw it to the screen. Here, X, here's all of the hard work. Now, could you just as a frame buffer dump this to the screen for me? And now what they're going to do is take X11 out of that altogether. Chrome will talk directly to the kernel, and the kernel will then display it directly on the screen through the kernel. Because the rendering processes all have their own compositors within the browser already. They're already within each, like within the browser architecture. So since the compositor is already there in the browser, all they need to do is just do a direct, well, code 
what is, they have to talk directly to that one ozone layer and they get directly to the kernel. They take the whole process of a what is it? Method of, or an indirection by like the yeah. Wayland or Mir protocols. Yeah. yeah. They're all an an indirection. It'll cost. So they're just trying to remove costs and they're not actually destroying the usability of Wayland or Mir because they already have the architecture and code in order to support all three. Good old Google. It's interesting to watch them really make their own Linux in a way, their own Linux distribution. Um, and you know, uh, I, I speak very highly of CoreOS, and they are inspired by Chrome OS in some ways. So, I, I have I have learned to to give Chrome OS more consideration. And uh, when Google announces they're doing something, to kind of sit back and go, "All right, what are they thinking, and why are they doing it this way?" Like, remember when they announced they were going to drop support for like Extended Four or something like that? Oh yes, yeah, that was a big that hoopla. Was a big hoopla. Yeah, <laughs> and then they kind big. of reversed on that. Um, and and then with the earlier we talked about in the episode the uh, dropping support for kernels earlier than three point sixteen, well that just turns out to be a proprietary software company that ends up working out in the open sometimes doesn't title things for public consumption and gets bit by the news cycle. Uh, in this case, you know uh, the initial reactions have been why aren't you using Wayland? Well, it turns out we don't really need to. We've already done the majority of the work. It's interesting. I wonder what happens down the road and how far Google can take this. Well, I think historically companies like Google like control. So even if it seems like it's just a you know self-centered, unneeded act, a lot of times they just feel more comfortable being in the driver's seat. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's true. Oh, Popey, you managed to make it just as we end the show. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, it's the daylight savings, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, I know. It is the worst thing ever that we purposely put ourselves through. Don't even get me ranting again. It's all right. We missed you. How is, how is uh, how are things in Ubuntu Touchland, Popey? Good. Busy, busy, busy. Yeah, I saw there was a community QA today, and your name was dropped in it. That was the only part I saw, and their name dropping you. So you're internet famous now. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all over now. It's the one part I saw, and their name <laughs> dropping you. I'm like, wow, that Popey. Everybody knows about him now. It's he's big time in us. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I uh, I had one question for you, Popey. Uh, has anybody oh, then. has have you heard anybody talking about somehow connecting the Pebble to Ubuntu for phone? Uh, which one, the old Pebble or the new Pebble uh, time? Well, not well. The time's not out yet. I got the Pebble Steel, and I, I just wanted to know if like I could get any. If if there is there any prospects of integration? I don't know. It's one of those things. I think you probably have to ask Pebble themselves. I know we've poked them. I mean, publicly, one of our developers tweeted at them when their uh, Pebble Time Kickstarter kicked off. Uh, Jimmy poked them on Twitter and said, "Hey, I work for Canonical. I would like to add support in Ubuntu for uh, the Pebble Time." So, yeah, with I don't know if they replied, and I don't know what conversations he's had with them, but you know they know we exist, Mm. (laughs) so (laughs) it would be nice. But um, you know, I've read articles about how they dropped uh, Windows Phone support, and they seem to do that in a not very friendly way. So I'm not hugely optimistic, to be honest. Hmm. Very good. All right. Well, uh, so I, you know, I want to make a, I want to make a plea again to the audience. I would love to get your runs Linux. Like, just, like, take a selfie, or for God's sakes, or don't do that, but a video or something of your setup. uh, Upload it to YouTube or Imager, Flickr, whatever you need to do. I'm not going to judge. Go over to Jupiter Broadcasting, click the contact link, choose a Linux action show from the dropdown, put Runs Linux in the subject line, and send it. I want Runs Linux from the people. I want yours out there for... For goodness sake, you got to have a decent Linux setup. I don't care. It could be your laptop. I don't care what it is. I just want to see it. And we can say, uh, and put your IRC handle in there so we can give you a call out or a Twitter handle or your name, whatever you go by. Maybe you're not some sort of weird internet person. Maybe you just have a real name. Whatever whatever you go by, put that in the email. Put a little description of what your setup is, and I'll feature it as a runs Linux. Videos are going to be more likely to be featured, uh, especially shorter ones, and I'd love to do that. I just Especially I, I, ones where you hold the uh, phone the correct direction. Yeah. That probably help. Yeah. <laughs> I just said I, I mention it from time to time, and it never really happens. But one of these days, one of these days, Matt, I will get an epic runs Linux from the audience. You just wait. You just wait. Hey, Matt, uh, is there anywhere you want to send folks throughout the week if they want to follow up on what Matt's up to? 
Uh, best place to go is uh, matthartley.com. Slide down to one of the subscription options there. All the stuff that I have going on is happening. Yeah. Uh, you can you know follow uh, social media. I also so have an email situation. It's such a yeah. good looking, modern looking website. I don't even. Absolutely. I don't even like under like. I need you to. You need to make me a site. It just looks good. People should go there. It just looks good. Matt's all fancy. I've actually got stuff. a couple other ones I'll yeah. show you. I think you might be all right yeah, with them. Nice. Pretty conscientious, but I'm, I'm still, you know, not like I would never say I'm a developer, yeah, but fancy. I, I'm, I'm comfortable. You fancy, comfortable. Matt. All right, everybody, join us live <laughs> next Tuesday. Go to jblive.tv on a Tuesday, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get it for your local time zone. We'd love to have you live, and that mobile room's open. You can join us in that virtual lug if you don't get the time zone messed up like Popey did. See you back here <laughs> <laughs> next week. It is the weirdest thing. You'd think when you when you have an audience of Linux users and you say, "Hey, send me your runs Linux setup," you'd think you get one or two from time to time. I mean, I get a couple, but they're you know. I'm I not. have a I have so, a, a theory. Yeah, what is that? I think it's because of all the all the times we run Linux for the past you know couple years or so, there all have been something that's kind of awesome, like a movie studio yeah, or something yeah. like that. People are like, "Mine's not like, that cool." Mine's yeah. not that cool. No, I know yeah, that's I the whole point. Though. A, that's the whole point. Is I want the people's runs Linux. I want the people's runs Linux. There's a, a magazine Linux Voice, and in the back on the back cover, uh, they have a little um, bit that's got a Q and A with someone and a photo of their of their workstation, and they do it every month, and it's quite cool. You should you know just ask people to do that. You know, send yeah. in a photo yeah. of your workstation. That would be cool. Oh, that's a shame. I've got some I've got something to add. Oh, uh, right go now. ahead and add away. Oh, go go ahead, ahead and add away. I'll turn off the motivational music. You can add away. Yeah, yeah. Turn that turn that rubbish off. What do you got? What do you got for it? <laughs> I was trying um, to get people to vote. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Go and vote. Go and go and go and think up better titles because apparently they're all crap. They're crap. Um, and whilst you're thinking up better titles, I'll uh, I'll have a chat with Chris. Um, on uh, Linux Action Action Show, mm -hmm. you and Noah mentioned uh, they had a feedback from a user who was looking for accessibility options under Linux. Yes. Okay, I can talk a little bit about this. So, um, with regards to screen readers, Orca is really where it's at. That's your only option. And if I forget the name of the um, the person that had written in, but if they're not happy with Orca, it's quite possibly that they're not happy with the voices that uh, Orca's using. And Orca isn't the actual um, uh, the speaking software. It's eSpeak. And what they probably need to do is head over to Sonar GNU Linux. They make uh, an accessible operating system that's based on Manjaro, uses GNOME 3, and they have some tweaks to eSpeak to sort of change the cadence of the voice. It still sounds a little bit um, robotic, but they're working with an external organization to bring some new voices to eSpeak that are a bit more natural. So um, I would suggest anyone that is blind or visually impaired start by heading over to Sonar GNU Linux, and they uh, they have an IRC chat room and also a Mumble server, uh, obvious for obvious reasons. And the people you need to speak to are either Kyle Bruard or Kendall Clark or Jonathan Nado, who's the, um, the president of the Accessible Computing Foundation, and they're the people driving all of this. Um, and if you don't get any um, any joy with um, Sonar GNU Linux, uh, I'm sure you will because they're the right people to talk to. Another operating system that's highly accessible and has, and has had the uh, thumbs up endorsement from the Accessible Computing Foundation is Ubuntu Mate, which is a uh, <coughs> fully accessible operating system. But we still have the rather crappy voices in eSpeak and are waiting for the Accessible Computing Foundation to refine the voices, and when they do that, we'll integrate them. Very nice. Thank Very you, sir. Very cool. Yeah.